Uh, in this occasion, this uh, lecture will be focused on uh, federated learning. And um, for me, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to introduce uh, Sadi. Sadi is an assistant professor in Helmstand Helms University in Sweden, but he's also an old friend because uh, he did his PhD here in, in Citius. In fact, I was one of his uh, co supervisors, and Manuel was the other one. So it's really great to have uh, a Sadi here uh, again. And um, Sadi, once uh, when when he finished his PhD, he got different postdoctoral positions. One of them in Italy, in was in the Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca, Ricerca in in Pisa, and he also got another two positions of universities in Sweden, in Uppsala and in Malmo. He's a really uh, cooperative researcher, he's very active, he is working with different groups in, in Europe. He's really focused on learning and in federated learning, also in EOT. So he has a large experience in many fields related with uh, artificial intelligence. So it's really an honor for us to have uh, Asadi here. And yeah, it's your turn. <laughs> You have this. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Empezamos un poco en español o digamos en inglés. Primero de todo, es mi honor estar aquí otra vez después de cuatro años y pico y ver esta gente conocida y trabajar otra vez con vosotros. Eh, thank you, David, for your presentation and for introducing me and having me here again. So today I'm going to talk about federated learning, future applications and challenges. So after I left Thetis here in 2018, or the beginning of 2019, so I got a different position at uh, Sweden. I start with Malmo University and IUT, uh, IUTAP Research Lab. Then I moved to Uppsala, then I start there with the federated learning story. So let's see what is federated learning and what is about and what is the main concept and what is going to solve. So está compartiendo no, pero estás compartiendo el el escritorio mismo para la presentación, sir. Eh Sí, pero no, pero porque no nos compartimos. Abre. Vete aquí, sir. Vete aquí a. Uh, ahí, uh, perdón, sí, a eso, sí. Vale, ahí debería estar. So. So, most of us, we know what is AI, AI, and what it's about. So. So all of us, we know what is AI and what is about. So what is AI in general? AI, it's a code plus data, whereas the data is the main part of the AI system. Without data, we cannot do anything. So the data is like a food for the human. And we can see here the code. It's the model that we are going to develop in order to train it over the data that we have. And after that, to share the knowledge that we got from the data and to discover the hidden pattern in the data. So the, ma the model could be machine learning or statistical algorithms, so on so far. So the data can be generated from different resources, such as IoT devices, from health systems, and from internet of vehicles, for example. And there is much more of from social media so on so far. So as we see here, the data is the food for AI. So most of the people, they are focusing mainly in their research in the model here. So they are focusing how to develop the model and to have very good model with very high accuracy. But unfortunately, we can see here 99% of the people that are focusing on the model to have a good model, but unfortunately, the main idea or the, the more important part before 
developing the model is to focus on the data and to have very good quality data. Without having a good quality data, we cannot have very good AI model or machine learning model. So based on the study that have been carried out by Deep Learning Lab, so they say 90, 99% of the researcher, they just focusing 20% of the model development and 80% of the research, which is equivalent to 1% of the researcher, they are focusing on, they, they, are, they are just 1%, they are focusing on data quality. So I would like to highlight here two main concepts. So the first one, it's model-centric view and data-centric view. And what is the difference between both of them? So in the model-centric view, you can collect as much as you want data. Then after that, you can, you have to iterate the model many times in order to reach the accuracy that you are looking for or the performance. Then the data-centric view, it's the opposite side. You have to work in the data, iterate the data many times to have very good data quality data, then after that you can get very good model based on the quality data that you have. So the same people, they carried this experiments and they develop, they develop a baseline and model centric and data centric view. And they found that if you are going to focus on the data using this still defect detection data set, so you will improve the model comparing to the baseline around almost 70%, 17%. While in the model-centric view, you are not going to gain anything in terms of improving the model. Then after that, comparing this with other data sets, they also, in order to generalize the result, they have the same behavior. So one of the most part and the most important part in our area, it's the data. But nowadays we are facing some different problems like data privacy, how you are going to share the data. Here in this experiment, they have the data centrally and they are trained the model there and they got what they want. They can tackle the data, they can touch the data. But normally in in our life right now, especially with the sensitive data, you cannot touch the data because it's a privacy concern. And also we have another problem, it's computation cost. So if we are going to move the data to one centric station, in order to train the model and to, to have an AI model with a good accuracy, it's gonna cost us a lot. And there is a lot of potential rooms for attackers to attack our data and to get the data. So what is the solution for that? One of the solution, you can use differential privacy, you can use uh, MPC, you can use different encryption and decryption technique. But those techniques also, they are going to collect the data and to have the data in one place. And this doesn't work for us. So one of the good techniques in order to solve this problem is to use federated learning. So what is federated learning? What is about and how it's gonna work? So if we are going to assemble these different puzzles together, I will introduce federated learning at the beginning. Then we can see what is the federated learning taxonomy. Then after that, there is a framework that I worked on at Uppsala University we developed. It's an open source framework called FIDIN, which is carried out by Uppsala University and a company called Scale Out, Swedish company. Also, some applications of federated learning, challenges, and what is the future work and some research directions. So what is federated learning? So the federated learning, the idea of federated learning start in 2016 by Google, which was developed by Mac Mahan. Google, they want to have a good model and to train a model using the data in your phone without moving the data from your phone. What they did, so they tried to have the initial model here in their server. Then after that, they will check, send some messages to your mobile and they will check the status of your phone. If it's ideal, not busy, and it's in the charger, this is during the night. 
So if that's okay, then they send the model to your device and the model gonna be trained in your data and your device. Then after that, you will have a new model with a new weight, which is called the gradient or parameters. Then after that, the, the weight will move to the cloud in their server and they will do some magical there, which is called aggregation algorithm using aggregation algorithm. And the first aggregation algorithm was the, the name is fit average by averaging the weight together because they used a neural network there. So by averaging the weight together, they will extract a new knowledge, which is going to combine different knowledge from different models, which is going to have sharing the knowledge from different clients or different workers without touching the data. And at the same time, if we can see here, they used our devices in order to train their model. Say so they, they don't pay anything in terms of computational cost. So this is the idea. So based on that, federated learning, normally what we are doing, we are taking the machine learning model and the data set and we put them together and we train the, the model in the centralized mode, which means we move the data to the machine learning model. But in the federated learning, we are doing the opposite. We are moving the machine learning model to the data side and we train the model there. Then after that, we got the result that we are looking for or the knowledge that we are looking for. So based on that, so first of all, we have different fears, different steps. As we can see here, the first step is to have the initial model. Then you have the contributor, as we can see here, or the clients in order to create the federation. And after that, after getting the agreement between different, the server and the clients, which is the simplest scenario, the simplest architecture for federated learning to have a client server, okay? Or server client, master server. So they share the model to the client and the client gonna take the model architecture, then we'll train the model there based on the data they have. After that, they will share the model again in the last step. And in the last step, the fourth one here, we can see, see here in the, in the server, it's gonna aggregate all the models that we have from different clients in order to extract the global models. Then based on the number of rounds, this is a process from step one to step four, we call it communication round or training round. Based on the number of rounds that you identify at the beginning, it will continue. So after round four, if you have, for example, uh, after step four, if you have round number two or three or four, we are going to have the final global model here from the server, and we will share it again to all the client in order to perform second iteration or second round, so on so far. So in the federated learning, we have different architecture based on or different categories based on the type of the federated learning. So we have vertical federated learning and horizontal federated learning. What is the difference between both of them? So the main difference between both of them, the vertical federated learning, the horizontal federated learning and vertical federated learning, horizontal federated learning, we have the same sample, uh, different sample with different person, but they are sharing the same feature space. So this is the first idea. While here in the second, the vertical one, they are not sharing the same, same feature space. So they have some part of the features about this sample with different clients or with different parties. So another category of the federated learning based on the use case. So we have something called cross solio and the cross device. Where the cross solio, you will have some very high computational data or very big data set that you cannot perform it in using IoT devices, each devices. So where you need here to have a good server, a good device in order to perform it. This is applicable for the healthcare scenario. Okay, where you have different, different. Uh, hospitals, they are connecting to server. Here in this scenario, this architecture, we have different companies, they have different problems, and they are going to solve it using the FedEx architecture. The another one, it's called 
Express device, which is applicable in smart cities and IoT devices, where you have a lot of limited resources devices that you are going to carry there some training process and to move the training to the edge device in, in order to extract the knowledge. Also, this is a new concept. All we know, we have Internet of Things, but they have, we have another concept called Internet of Disconnected Things. How it's come? So the main difference between Internet of Things and Internet of Disconnected Things is here we can see here in the client side, we have two different chips, two different microchips. The first one here, it's connected to the internet, to the main server, where we are going to carry the communication with the server in order to talk to the outside. While in the second chip here, or micro chip, Jetson Nano, whatever, Raspberry Pi, whatever, we are going to do the computational process there by training the model, having the data there, having access to the data and everything. So when we want to start a federated learning, with Internet of Disconnected Things, what we are going to do, we are going to talk to this guy here. Then after that, this guy will initiate a bridge between the device connected to the Internet with the second device that we have it in the backbone. So it's going to send a message here and it's going to tell him we have to start training our model because we are doing some uh, we want to share some knowledge. So after the model is trained here and finished, with this device will initiate or will establish the bridge again with this device, and this device will transfer it to the main server. When it's gonna send the weight to this device, it will disconnect immediately in order to make it much more secure. Okay, so this is the main idea about of disconnected things. So. So federated learning architecture, also we have different kind of architecture based on the architecture. We have single server as we saw at the beginning. You have the server, they have the, the contributor or the clients. Then we have clusters. So different clients, they are connected together to one server based on their data set, based on their activity, based on some categories that we can identify there. Then after that, those devices, they can connect to another server in order to extract and to build the final global model. We have hierarchical federated learning, which we will see it's the same architecture, more or less like FIDIN later on, where you have different layers. The first layer is the client here, and the second layer, it's going to do some local aggregation in order to have partial global model. Then after that, we can report this partial global model to the main server up there in order to have the final global model. Why is that? What is the idea behind that? In order to reduce the load for this server and to distribute the, the communication and the workload among different devices. Multi-server overlapping, it's more or less the same. But we have here some, some devices, they are falling between different regions, which is the right example for this. If you are having your phone and you are walking between two different satellites or two different um, uh, phone cover area and you have two different uh, bridge, so you might have some intersection between them. So you might report to this bridge or to the second one. So this is the idea. And we have this, the circle, cycle, ring one, where each client is going to report to the second client, and the second client will report to the second one, and it's going to form a ring architecture. So, federated machine learning, the main idea is behind, first of all, training the model. So after that, how we are going to construe, how we are going to build, to construct the final global model. It's based on the aggregation function that we have. The simplest one 
it's called fit average by taking the weight for the neural network then each layer it will be average with the corresponding layer for the second model so on so far there is a lot of algorithms in order to do this based on the problem that we are going to to solve for example we have this fit average and we have the algorithm then after that we have fit approx which is going to deal with the problem of the non iid data which is non identical identical uh, non independent identical data uh, distribution sorry we have another one nova we have one for the cluster which is going to deal with the clustering we have much more so you cannot control all of them because if you are going to look to the literature you might find 50 60 every day there is much more algorithms some of them they are going to tackle the problem with the neural network some of them it's going to work with traditional machine learning some of them going to work with unsupervised or reinforcement learning so based on the problem you can select whatever you want so the taxonomy of federated learning we can see here the federated learning could be applicable in different areas and based on the algorithm you can see here federated averaging so you can see here different uh, publication and different studies so now we have one of the problems that we have right now in the federated learning. For example, different clients or different companies, they have their own model and they want to participate in the federation, but they don't want to change the model. So they agree together with the main server or to the third party in order to have the federation, but they don't want to change the model. For example, I have in my company Random Forest, you have support vector machine, you have decision tree, you have a neural network, you have deep learning model. So in this sense, what is the solution for that? How are we are going to solve it? So there is different solution, but still we don't have the optimal solution for that. Because after that, for example, when you aggregate the model in a specific way, you have to send back to me the same model. I don't want to change my model, okay? So there is some techniques like using ensembling and some technique using knowledge distillation, so on and so far. But still, we, we have some problems there. There is a lot of things to do there. So federated learning can be applicable for semi-supervised and supervised and reinforcement learning. And also we have different application in Internet of Things image segmentation, image processing, recommendation system, so on and so forth. So nowadays, every day, we can see a lot of frameworks, open source frameworks coming to the community. So we have different open source frameworks like Substra, we have TensorFlow, we have Hedl, we have PySoft, we have FedML, we have uh, Open Federated Learning from Intel, we have Flower, which has become one of the most important one right now, and they have very big community. We have Fate, we have Ambedia, it's called Aniclara. We have Federated Learning from IPM, we have Vantage, which support this support both vertical and horizontal federated learning. And we have Leaf. And finally, I'm, I'm, I'm not listing all of them. I'm going to talk just some examples. I'm going to talk about our federated learning FIDEN framework. So, different tools can be used in order to develop your federated learning framework and different algorithms. So if you are going to tackle some problem of de-identification regarding to the privacy, you can use some anonymization techniques, differential privacy, so on and so forth, encryption technique, differential privacy attack based approach. But 
If we can see here in the top layer, we have the federated learning frameworks like Intel, Flower, TensorFlow, so on and so far. How this federated learning framework gonna work? So there is behind those frameworks or behind these architectures, we have different or many tools, many frameworks that can work together in order to have this framework successful. So if you are going to have some data sharing agreement, how you are going to share the data. When I'm saying data sharing agreement, which I'm referring here to the parameters, to the gradient, the knowledge that we got from the local model, we are going to share to the server. IP protection and security, if the normally we are talking about distributed system. So you have one client in Sweden, one client in Spain, one client in Jordan, so on and so forth. So you can identify the IP address, how you are going to hide it, some common model and data governance, so on and so forth. So we have some infrastructure where you where you are where are you going to hold or to host your server? Might be in the cloud. You might use also different development techniques, uh, tools like Kubernetes, Docker. Uh, you might use Spark for parallelization for to parallelize the training process. Data, how how you are going to save the data, where you are going to store it, sub software. Mainly, now the people that are using Python in order to develop all of those frameworks. So there is a lot. So behind Python, they can use TensorFlow, Keras, uh, and also they're using PyCharm, so on and so forth. So let's talk about our lovely federated learning framework. It's called FIDIN, which I said at the beginning, it's carried out, it's developed by collaboration between Uppsala University and Scaleout, the company. So, in the FIDIN, FIDIN follows MapReduce architecture. We have three main layers. The lower layer here is called the clients and the contribut contributor. The second layer, combiner. And the third layer, the reducer. And you can scale it as much as you want. There is no problem with the scaling. So, now, we have controller. We are using MongoDB and another tool called Menu in order to save the trained model. So each time when we get the global model in each iteration or in each communication round, we are going to save it in Menu. So Mongo going to, we are going to store some data about each communication round, like accuracy, like events, what happened during this communication round. Discovery service, which is going to uh, discover and to see all the components that are going to establish the federation and to create this federation. So the controller is going to control all the clients and the combiners. Some one of them going to drop out what happened, what is the solution, what we have to do. And also on the controller, we are we having there the helper and we're having the aggregation function. So now, what can happen in the reducer? We have different combiners from combiner one to combiner n that are connecting together. Then in each for each combiner, we can connect different clients in order to reduce this the bottleneck here for the reducer to not having a lot of communication flow and to not overflow the reducer for the in, in the computation was while you are going to construct the final global model. So when you install FIDIN, how it's going to work, what we have to share, what we have to upload. So we have two main things after installing and configuring FIDIN. We have to have the initial seed model, which is the initial machine learning model initiated with a random weight. And the second thing we are going to share or to upload the framework, the computation package, the compute package. What do we have in the compute package? 
in the compute package, it's gonna tell the framework the instruction how we are going to train the model, how we are going to validate the model, then after that, how we are going to send it back to the reducer. So this is an old architecture. Then we did some refactoring. It's going to be just one file, but in the, we have the same concept. So we have the training. It's going to tell the framework how we are going to train the model, and you have the architecture of the model and the validation. So model in and the model out. Model in, which is the seed model that we have at the beginning, initiated with a random weight. Then we have the model after training. So the compute package here, you can see it, training and validation. And we have the entry point in order to see how it's going to work. And the entry point, it's already using JAML file. Just one thing to I have, I would like to know, uh, to highlight here. In Fiden, in order to make it easy to install and to, to configure it, we are using, you can use, install it using Docker, or you can install it natively. So Docker, in order to save this dependency, in order to, to not bring the headache to yourself in terms of installing this and that. So this framework is already published in CC Grid conference. And we can see here, we did some experiments. And one of the experiments to see the capacity of the combiner, each combiner, how many clients we can host for one combiner. So we start here by adding, starting by 200 clients, then we accumulate, we aument the number of the client until we reached 1000 and it was perf working perfectly. What we noticed here, okay, the time it's gonna be the double, but still working without any problem. So also, what we can see here in this experiment, what we would I would like to to talk about. So we had one combiner with two clients and one combiner with five clients, one combiner with ten clients, and we have the accuracy for the centralized model. So I would like to highlight here from the federated learning perspective, comparing to the model with the centralized model. With more clients, with more contributor, sometimes you can outperform the baseline, the central model, because you have contributor and knowledge from different clients. And also what we notice also, if you have a lot of data in one place and you are going to train the model, a huge amount of data, sometimes the model cannot capture the hidden pattern of the data because the data is very, very big. So if you split the data to small chunks, then you train the model, you might outperform and you, the model gonna learn much better. So this is one of the things that we, we noticed. So this is the repetition, the same. Okay. Also, we test the framework by having some components in the United States, some components in Sweden and in Europe, North Europe, and it was working perfectly without any problem regarding to the geographical distribution. Also, with one combiner and six clients, two combiners, 12 clients, so aumenting the number of clients with the number of combiners, we can see here the execution time. Why? Here, if you are going, you can see if you are going to take the average of all of them in this point and this point in this part, you will end up like the same, the first one, where you have one combiner and six client, because it's just multiplied by two and three and four. But we can see here you have some the, the execution time for the entire round become larger or bigger. Why is that? It's because sometimes we have some stragglers. What is the stragglers? So you might your client, when you are going to train the model, have just small amount of resources and it's cannot 
can not be able to finish the training process during the specific time that you want to, like other clients. So this caused the problem. And this is, we will see it later on, the interface, part of the interface of the hidden. Sorry. This is another research that we are carrying right now. It's the paper, it's uh, submitted to IEEE AI. So what we are going to do in the client, each client, we want to train the model in an efficient way. So what I'm going to do here, we don't want to train the entire model. We want, if you have company and you have different devices in the company and your devices, they are idle, so we can get some benefit out of those devices. By phrasing part of the model and assign part of the model to train in node one and node two and node three, then after that, aggregating all of them to have the final model here to share it with the combiner. So, here we can see in the algorithm where client updates, we are going to select some layers randomly and freezing them and freeze the other layers. The layers selected randomly, we are going to train them and the next client is going to do the same. So, what result we got? So we can see here, we have, this is the model VGG16, trend over Cypher 10 data set. So what we get here, so the baseline was almost 87 accuracy. By training three layers, where you are going to take in your account, by training part of the model, you will save time and you will save some resources on the client side, in the edge node. By training three layers, still at the beginning, we have some oscillation. The model is jumping up and down because it doesn't capture the behavior of the data, the knowledge. Then after that, start stabilization, stabilized, and converge in the smoothly. So training roughly half of the model around six, seven layers, we can see here the difference between six layers and 10 layers and the full model, not that much. The gap very small. So by training half of the model, you can achieve a good result, acceptable accuracy compared to the centralized model. And also you will gain some resources and you will gain some time. This is another Another result we got. So we have seven layers. Here it's, you should add just one layer because it's a typo. So if you are going to train seven layers using 10 clients, we have the result up there, here. But now let's suppose that in your company or in your institute, you cannot, you don't have that 10 clients with fully resources like this seven clients, where 10 clients with seven layer. But you have 20, which is the double of the lines that we have here at the beginning with smaller, smaller amount of resources available. So if you are going to train the model using these small amount of resources that we have using 20 clients using the seven layers, the same seven layers, we can see here you can achieve slightly better result, better than training the seven layers using 10 clients. Taking your account, the data, the amount of data for training 10 clients, it's the same for 20 clients. But here in the 20 clients, you have to split the data half compared to the 10 clients. So this is another one also. We can see here training quarter of the data using five clients. And here we have seven layers, 10 layers, and 14 layers. We can see here 
by increasing the amount of data and the clients, which means increasing the clients, will affect the global model, the final model accuracy and the knowledge. Also, we try to use Jitsin Nano, which is restricted devices, IoT device, in order to use it as a client to train them within their machine learning model. At the beginning, we have if first of all we use some flavor in the cloud. We can see here this flavor with one CPU and one gigabyte, and to train four layers took this amount of time. Then we increase some resources, and we were able to train 10 layers. After that, it's crashed. So this is by freezing some layers. If we are going to train the entire model, the entire model, the 14 layer, at the beginning, we could not train anything here. So by training here in these two flavor, by training the full model, the machine is crashed. So if you are going to phrase part of the model, then you are going to compare it, uh, you are going to share it, you will achieve good result and you can train the model, even if you are going to lose part of the accuracy. So application taxonomy, we talked about it a little bit. So federated learning nowadays is very famous and it's mainly used for sensitive data, especially in healthcare scenario. So if we are going to talk a bit about NLP, three, four months ago, the chat GPT just popped up and we all know that you can do whatever we want with chat GPT. You can ask him whatever you want and it's gonna give you good answer. So they train the chat GPT using a lot, a lot, a lot of data. So if we are going to perform the same scenario here in Thetius, so it's gonna cost the university a lot of money. But if we are going to train the machine learning model and to share the knowledge using different edge devices and sharing the knowledge, you might achieve the same behavior like chat GPT, but you need the data. We use FIDIN with collaboration with Research in Sweden to, for image segmentation, to identify the tumor, brain tumor. So what happened there? We trained the machine learning model. The model was unit model, and we trained there using FIDIN. Use the, there were different clinics in Sweden, distributed one in Stockholm, one in Blekinge, one in Yon Shopping, and one more in Norbro. So by training the model in different clinics, even the clinics they are belonging to the research, they could not share the data between them, among them, because illegal there. And they are very restrict with the GDPR regulations. So the only way what we did, we trained the unit model using federated learning with FIDIN there, and they got very good results. So the model, after training the model using this images, we have another model in order to generate a treatment plan for the patient. What is the next step we have to do? Another application, FedEquas, it's already published. The paper is already published there. So we use different question answering system data sets, and we train different clients using those data sets in order to build this uh, FedEquas. FedPot, it's already submitted to the journal, and the same, but here, we had some part 
regarding to the human or expert in loop, and we have interactive learning. What I mean by interactive learning, so the main problem of the data set or the data that we got, for example, from sensors, from IT devices, how to label the data, and it's very costly. In order to label this data, you have to hire some people and it's going to take time. What we did here, so we integrate interactive learning on using human expert in the framework by collecting or by selecting random example and send it to the expert in real time and the expert gonna label them and using this labels data we can improve the model accuracy but taking your account this expert it's in the data site so it's not from outside in order to keep the data privacy now we are carrying some research there at Halmstad University with two different regions. We have two different hospitals. One is called Region Urubru and another region is called Region Halland. We are employing FIDIN there. So they have this layer, this is Sharpik, in order to extract the data and represent the data as a graph. Then after that, we are going to extract the data from this graph in order to train the machine learning model in this client, then share it with the combiner and the combiner gonna send it back after extracting the local or the partial global model. Then after that, we are going to extract or build the final global model. Take in your account and fit in, in the combiner level and then the reducer level, we implement there the same aggregation function, which is the fit average because we are supporting there neural network. This another paper that we carried with one of my colleagues, he was here at Titius, Khalid al Kharabsha. So it's federated learning base for code smell detection. So we used federated learning here. So first of all, we tried to use three different data set. One data set collected and built by Khalid, and two data sets from the literature, one Fabio Paloma and Francesca Fontana. We trained the model in the central mode, centrally, centrally, and we got those accuracies. Then after that, we did another experiment by training the model, training the model using, for example, Fabio data set, the first data set, then we validate the model using the second two data set, Khalid and Fontana. So we saw there, there is problem with the accuracy, the, the model lose a lot of accuracy. There is some depth problem, technical depth. So then, so what we did, we took different companies to simulate those, we split these data set to different companies in total to have 10. So this Fabio, I think we split it to four and Francesca Fontana, we kept it to one because it's very small. Then Khalid's data set, we split it to five. In total, we have 10 data sets, okay? Then after that, we, We did experiment there using FIDEN, federated learning for 100 rounds. And this is more or less the cross organization settings, how it was. So what happened? We can see here the loose function, it's decrease and start to, the model start to improve the learning process and to capture the hidden pattern. So this is the rock value for the 10 clients. And we can see here, the rock value shows very good convergence in the model performance, which can achieve very high results for 100 rounds. Now also we are working with Internet of Vehicles. We have another a project there at uh, Halmstad University. So we have Kaiser. 
So we have Kaiser for Health and we have Kaiser for Vehicles, which is collaboration with Volvo. So what we are looking there, we are trying to have the federated learning there in Internet of Vehicles to collect some data from the vehicles, sharing the knowledge and to have some something related to the maintenance. If something happened to the car, what we are going to do, what is the plan and how we are going. Might be this problem, for example, happened to this car. It doesn't appear before, so how we are going to share this knowledge might be we can get it from others. So, also the last part of the FIDIN, now at Uppsala University and Scale Out, they are working, all of us we know, uh, MLP, machine learning operations. Now they are developing something called stacking, which is federated learning operation. So where FIDIN is part of it. So the main challenges of federated learning so we can see here, because we cannot touch the data and we have a problem with the data because of data privacy. So we have data imbalance, might be system heterogeneity, privacy concern, expensive communication, resource reallocation, so on and so forth. How we are going to solve this problem? This is one of the challenges that we have right now. Of course, there is some research is carried out there, but still there is a room for much more research. One of the challenges, take contribution. So suppose that we have different companies, Volvo, Fiat, Toyota, Tesla, so on and so far, and all of them, they are interested in the knowledge of each other, and they want to have the knowledge of each other. So impossible, Volvo, they are not going to share their data with Fiat because they are competing in the market. Also, Ford, they are not going to share it with Tesla. So the only way is to have just the knowledge, not to share the data. So they agreed to each other after the signing the agreement and everything. They want to have the federation and to start training the model in order to share the knowledge. What happened? They have their data and the server send the initial model, the seed model with a random weight. And after that, each company, they will start training their model. Unfortunately, this guy, Tesla, he don't want to share his real knowledge. He want to share some fake data. He generates some sample using GAN algorithm, so on and so forth. And after that, he going to share fake knowledge. How we are going to solve this problem? This is one of the challenges that we have right now. Some people or some ideas, it's moving around by taking the model from this guy and validate it with Volvo data, sending the model to the Volvo data. So let's the clients talk to each other and somehow using some coordinator up there. So if the accuracy of this model, for example, we achieved here in Tesla 90%, when you validate it using Volvo data set, it's a drop to, for example, 40. So there is something wrong. You have to consider it. Also, we move the model again to another one and validate it. So this is one of the way that we were thinking about. Another problem, the same, but some of the clients dropped out. Sorry. Dropped out like all stragglers, like Ford. They cannot share their final model. Something happened there because of resources, because of uh, connection problems, so on and so forth. Also, how we are going to solve this problem? Some people, they said, we can also have some scheduler up there and what we can do here using the scheduler, we can each communication round, we can select specific number of contributor in order to participate to have the final global model. And some of them in the next round, we can select another one. So this is one of the things in order to have the, the knowledge from all of them. 
the communication problem, this is how they are going to drop out. Or it's drop out, how we are going to solve it also. It's more or less the same scenario. So, future directions, how to work with the heterogeneous models, a new, how to propose a new fusion algorithm or aggregation algorithm. Explainable AI, as I noticed, within two days, we will have a lecture from Moncho University about explainable AI. And also taking your account, explainable AI now, we had some discussion with the lawyers there in Sweden. So if you are going to talk about data privacy and explainable AI and the machine learning model, they consider sharing the weight, this is kind of leaking some information. Because some people, they can do some reverse engineering and they can extract uh, the original data. And somehow. How to optimize the machine learning model in each client side? Model optimization, data augmentation. Sometimes you need some donated data in the server in order to validate. Nowadays, we cannot validate in the server. What we are doing is to share the model accuracy and the model weight from the client side and in the server, we are going to do the average there of the accuracy that we achieve. So how we are going to share or donate some data that fully anonymized with the server in order to validate the final global model. Communication efficiency, when and how we are going to send the model weights to the server in order to construct the final global model. Also, we have the trustworthy, how we are going to trust this guy. He will participate in his the knowledge he get from his real data, not participating in the fake data. So this is all about federated learning. I'm so sorry for taking long time, but if there is no problem, I'm going to show you the demo about FIDEN, if you all agree. So already I prepared here and my laptop, just let me. So this is the combiner. So we have the reducer up here and let me bring this browser. So this is the FIDIN after running the reducer domain server. So first of all, we are going to upload the initial compute package. So we have Keras and PyTorch. We are supporting this. We have Keras. So package. The compute package, it's the this client. It's the tar file of this client. So we upload it. Then after that, we upload the initial model. I'm going to take a little bit. OK. So in the network here, we can see just to have the reducer. Let's run the combiners and different clients. Here the combiner. Here we go. Then here I have three different clients. And the data, each client has his own data. 
they are not sharing anything. So if we come back here to the network, you can see here the combiner, the client one, client two, client three, and the reducer. So let's start the training process. We have to go to the control five rounds, for example, you can increase it as much as you want. Here you can identify the timeout for each round. Then if you want to validate, you can validate. If you don't want, it's up to you. Here it's validate and let's start running. So we can see here it's going to start training the machine learning model. So it's going to take a bit. Let's leave it a little bit till it's finished. If you have any question, we can. Thanks. Thank you, Sadi. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Does anybody have any question here in the room? I have one question that's regarding what you mentioned before that uh, in order to work with uh, restricted devices uh, locally, you could frame just part of the network, a subset of layers. In that case, how do the local learners decide the layers which are going to uh, learn? I mean, is that decision on the learner or is a global decision? So there is two different ways. First way, we are selecting the layer randomly. This one way, what we are doing right now. And the second way, if you saw the picture, we have three different components. One is called discovery, aggregator, and distributor. Discovery going to check all the resources that we have on the thesis, for example, and how much resources do we have in each client, in each node. Then this percentage of resources going to send out to the distributor. And the distributor, based on the resources that you have in your device, it's going to split part of the model based on the number of uh, trainable parameters, uh, number of layers, so on and so far, then after that, share it. So when you share it to the client, we will have some uh, hash table or something like that, gonna register there, the client ID and which layers this client gonna train. Then after that, in the aggregator, we are going to do the aggregation. So we have two different solutions. Okay, thank you very much. And may I ask? Yeah, yeah, of um, And you mentioned the fake, um, Contribution. A contribution. And in that case, in that case, you mentioned the possibility of um, validating the, using different clients. Yes, but that would work only, I understand, if data is ID, because if it's not ID, then you could have a problem. Yes, if it's non ID, you could have a problem. But uh, if you are going to do it and to check it with different clients, if you like ensembling voting algorithm. So I don't think so all of them, they will have the same drop. You know, it might be a variation between one to the second, but this is one of the solution that we are thinking about. But there is much more solution using, for example, uh, having some uh, security techniques and some, some blockchain and something like that. So this is one of the things that we are thinking about. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. More questions? Daddy. Yep. In the same con context, it's very difficult to distinguish between the situation in which a company are trying to do fake, uh, fake data, that uh, the situation in which the company have very, very different context than another one. So you mean if you have different companies and yes. these companies they are in different countries? Yes. And might be one of them going to share fake contribution? Yes, but uh, this... You need they have different kind of data yes. or different no, not feature. in context in which the data are, are, gener are generated. generated. So normally the first phase before starting the federated learning or federation, they agreed together what kind of feature they are going to select and what kind of data they are going to participate on the federation during the communication round. So this is in horizontal. But if it's going to be in vertical, it's going to be a bit difficult because 
you might have, for example, in vertical, let's see, I'm going to give you an example about the vertical scenario. The university, they have some data about you. At the same time, the bank have some data about you. And when you go to the Ayuntamiento or the province house, yes. they have some other data about you. They are having some intersection between the feature, but they don't have the same features. So this is the scenario. So how you are going to solve it? Still, I'm not pretty sure. But I'm talking about the horizontal because it's much more easier in terms of fake data. So you might also implement their anomaly detection algorithm in another layer. It could work. So this is research. But I think the point of Jose is if you have a poor data set, imagine that you are in a company that you have a poor data set okay. with poor results in comparison with the other companies. So you don't want to share fake data. You have bad data, uh, a bad data set. Bad data set. OK. Uh, I don't know how to answer this question, to be honest with you. I didn't think about it, but uh, of course, there is a way how to. You might share, for example, you might share, for example, some statistical information about your data, the size of the data, um, the distribution of the classes, something like that. Might be this going to help in order to avoid the problem of this fake or not fake. This is what I'm thinking right now. But of course, still, this is an open research and there is a lot of things to do there. And how can you uh, deal with biased models? I imagine a scenario in a cross device yeah. with thousands or millions of devices working together, but part of the devices or most of the devices are, for instance, in the United States. Yeah. So probably the models created in the United States are different from models created in China, for instance. Yeah. And when you are returning back the the the, 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 the weight, the model, the, the final model, people from China obtain a poor model in comparison with the original one. Yeah, this in different good. iterations are getting a poor, a poor, a more poor model than. Uh, you, you can decide if you replace the model or not. You can decide in order to exclude this contributor. For example, if you want to not have any knowledge from his side. Have you got the idea? So you have different companies. Or different. Do you mean uh, to try to be more fair, statistically speaking? Like 25% uh, of the devices are from the United States, another 25 for China, but yeah, to avoid this, uh, yeah, you might select some, uh, yeah, some device. select some devices uh, in a balanced way, and you have to take in your consideration the kind of the data they have there, the resources, and these kind of things in order to not fall again on the stragglers problem. Okay, but once you send back the model, mm. you always re you always replace the model. Each time when you send reproducast the model again, you have to broadcast the global model, the final model that you got, not the same model. So all the clients should have the final model. Yeah, the final model, which is the new update, the new weights. Even when the this model is worse for this specific client. So now there is a way for this. So you can look some information about local model in each device. If the model in the local device it's outperform the global model. You can keep the local model, okay. and you cannot. That was my question. If, if you want, you can, you can ignore the new global model. So this is one of the solution. Okay. But in this sense, you have to take in your account the knowledge from those people. It's more or less like lambda architecture. If you have the model perform better than the online model, so you can swap them. If no, I mean the uh, offline training and the online uh, running model. Okay. So this is what I'm thinking. More questions? So here we we got some result from the. Okay, I didn't uh, implement everything there in order just to show the use case. So we can see here the loose function for Cypher dataset. We just took three clients, third of the dataset. And we can see here accuracy, kappa. 
still it doesn't got the final result still computing. So, but it will come soon. Yep. Hey, regarding FEDEM, um, uh, the, the server, when you install it, the server will be local as well. Do you have to configure the server or can it be so remote? Right now, I'm installing everything in my machine because I had a problem with the connection with the cloud. So the server and the clients and the combiners, the reducer combiners uh, clients, they are hosted in my machine here. But you can install it wherever you want. You might have the reducer here in Thetius, and you have the combiner in uh, Castilla-La Mancha, and you have the client in uh, wherever you want, or you can host them in the cloud. So there is no problem with that. Just you have to do some configuration, the configuration related to the IP address of the reducer and the combiner. So you have to tell this client, the clients that we have there, they are going to contribute in the federation. Okay, we have this combiner and this combiner, and we have the IP address of the reducer. So the client can choose to which combiner he gonna join based on the geographic, uh, geographical distribution, geographical area. So this how we are going, how it works. Okay, thank you. And regarding the previous questions, uh, David comments, then could you also uh, apply in this kind uh, of uh, software personalization techniques? Because, for example, in that case, you could have part of the model global and the other half uh, personalized as well. Yeah. And so could that be... Uh, uh, then, yeah. You can do it, but what you can do what you have to do, you have to change part of it in. We have a three main component, reducer, combiner, client. You have to change in the client part. Okay. So even if you want, you can write it in the code and you send it, or you can change in the main class. So it's fully open source and you can do whatever you want. And if you need anything, you are welcome anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you very much for the Good. presentation. It was uh, wide, but simple enough even for me to understand. So uh, thank you very much because I'm not coming from this area. Okay, um, but in, in my area, in the area of data management from the old times, we have uh, federated databases yes. and we have uh, all those ideas and those problems from the very beginning. Um, we have many solutions, but the problems are still there. Um, one of the of the uh, differences in databases between federated databases and distributed databases is that in distributed databases you have many nodes and all of them are the same. Okay, are the same characteristics, and in federated databases they are heterogeneous. But there is another. Another characteristic is that in the federated databases, each node has its own objective. Mm -hmm. It exists by its own and uh, it decides to join a federation to have a second objective that is common to all of them. So in this kind of works, the model that is working in each device might have its own purpose to solve a specific problem and may you reduce, may you reuse, sorry, that model and share the knowledge to solve a different problem in the in the main and together with all the others. Is that the case? Yeah, this is, uh, it's, you can do it also using, there is two different things right now. There is meta learning, infidelity learning and transfer learning, infidelity learning. So you can do it also there. If you are not going to use the normal federated learning like this supervised learning, and we have the same problem, but if you are going to share it with different, uh, you have different objective or different goals, so you can use meta learning. So you can do some uh, domain adaptation or transfer learning itself. So you can do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I would like to know your opinion about the use of this technology between private companies. I mean, I can see the point of this technology in research and 
can also uh, see the point of this technology in the same company like Google with the Google board. Yeah. But thinking in different private companies where the data and knowledge is synonym of money, do you think that this technology is has it a room in with private companies? Do you have experience with projects where different private companies are working together, sharing you uh, their knowledge in order to improve the knowledge of the uh, so of based, the companies? Based on the research that we did, and right now in Uppsala University. The only things they are doing just with um, with healthcare scenario. So this is the idea. But now we are going to apply something like that with Volvo because Volvo, we might have it with another also collaborator from outside. So this is what uh, we are trying to do right now. But this also, at the end of the day, all of them, they are... Uh, they want to have the knowledge from different company in order to improve their model, which is going to lead later on to solve some problem they are not covered or uncovered by their model, so unseen. Mm -hmm. So this is going to work. There is no problem with that. But based on my knowledge, what I know, still we don't have anything like that. Might be with different different people, they carry something like that, but. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Step. So, more questions? Okay, we are running out of time, so I no. think we can close here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for this interesting yeah, presentation, Sadi. Yeah, welcome. No